Today we've been showing the set uh, and costume design for in parenthesis to the, the company of Welsh National Opera. From today, everybody else can start to be actively involved in the realisation of the design. We've had a lot of exploration of the realities of this whole experience, you know, in terms of all the various commemorations, but this is, a, this is a really something that is distilled into a piece of poetry and a piece of music um, years later. Here are the remains of this trench. You can see it kind of winding along. It's important for me emotionally and, and psychologically and atmospherically to have some sense of where it all took place. And then he says, all alone in the deeper shades, caught between rowan and hazel, Foxes are fleeing, unicorns break cover, the warrens are in shock, the birds cry out as their nests fall like stars, and their airy worlds gone crazed. So just to say, this is, this is the actual singer. I mean, he will be able to, this is a, a thing that he can crawl up into. So I think you will have a very, very real sense of the claustrophobia and the of horror of being in those kind of spaces. Shakespeare can produce uh, epic historical plays on a wooden O with nothing more than a stage. And, and I think that, that we, we, we thought that we wanted to do something similar to that. We saw it as something that was almost as if it was a, an event taking place in a chapel, in, a, in a, that very Welsh location, a kind of the chapel on a hillside somewhere where these people's lives and actions were being remembered. During a, a large part of the piece, the women who provide a very important commentary on the action are, are kind of, will be located in this upper balcony area of the, of the, of the chapel. It's kind of like a wooden arena that we've created that might be the inside of a chapel on some lonely Welsh hillside, but it's also like an arena for a conflict. We've got um, weathered boards on the floor, a slight raised platform, and then this sweeping cyclorama, which gives us the upper level. Then within that, the floor can raise to give us a trench or the nulla, which is the bank from which they attacked on the first day of the Somme. And we have a cyclorama into which we can light and project textures These taller panels, they're the downstage pieces, and they'll be on the downstage, and then the smaller ones as it diminishes going around the back as they're art-shaped. Some of them have been textured, and this with a graining tool here, and then with other washes of paint that settle into the surfaces, it just gives a nicer, more drier look to it, which just makes the whole thing more plausible and real then. This is the steelwork frames for the timber flattage to be supported. And they're making a curved structure. And the downstage pieces are taller. And as you go upstage, there's a diminished curve. This is the ground row here. And these will, these all linked up and we'll be creating an undulating line. And they'll be seen through the voids of the set. And hopefully they'll be the link between the set and to create distance of sea of landscape that links it into the cloth behind it. Right, now we're in Tyndall 2, as we call this area. So there's the trees and the floor in here. And the model setter, then this is going to be moving around and lifted up and pulled back. And then there's this sort of mirror effect and rusty timbers. And then that just fits in there. The pond line is going underneath. The boards are sitting inside that. They've been waterproofed underneath, so they won't distort or anything. The surface has been... We've had polystyrene that was carved, and then latex and crumb has gone over that to try and make it as waterproof as possible, whether it's running across or just water, so the people will be splashing around. And we've actually made little puddles. You can see some shapes here for water to sit inside. 
just a small quantity of water would have a big impact on the lighting of it. The whole shape being lit from behind, it's going to look so beautiful on stage, the lovely shadows and the light going behind it. We've made a lot of trees before and they've never really looked as quite as plausible as this one. And so everybody working on it is quite excited about this because it's got just it's like a real feel to it. They've come in bundles like this. And when they arrive, they look a bit tired and dead. So some of them we've cut up and some we've kept like this. And by bending them open and putting in different angles like this, 45 degrees, <laughs> and then bending it back down in on itself, and it just has so much more life in it. And by just having something that you've just taken out of the box and gone like that with, just difference is phenomenal, just a little bit of twisting and just trying to put some life into something. So this is a model of the tree and you're trying to think through how it's going to be made and giving it the kind of energy and values it's got and then suddenly in the workshop, a little bit of effort later, you look round and you think, wow, look what we've made. There are the soldiers, the main one of whom is Ball himself, and the officers of his unit, and some of the old soldiers who have almost themselves mythical qualities. They kind of talk as though they were the fighting with the Black Prince or at the Battle of Agincourt. You know, sort of soldiers from eternity, if you like. And then there are these two characters, the bards of Germania and Britannia, who are kind of narrators or people who lead you through the story, and they are also very much the link to this mythical element. We're going into quite a theatrical landscape. The ladies' chorus appear as dryads and will have branch arms and branch headdresses and masks, and so we end up in quite a mythological uh, place with the costumes.